See from the insignia that, uh, and the markings that uh, the C-54 is carrying at the moment, it's in uh, the Atlantic Division, which was uh, pertinent to the Berlin Airlift. And uh, that was the scheme that uh, Atlantic Warbirds uh, owners and operators uh, had opted to, to uh, put her into. Uh, it's, it's not the authentic scheme for this aeroplane, but it wasn't very far off. Uh, when we started researching the history of the aircraft, we found that uh, it was actually a Pacific Division aircraft. So um, based from Hawaii to Guam in the Philippines and also to California. So her, her area of travels was primarily the Pacific. Uh, and so the Atlantic Division, we're going to propose to actually change that to the Pacific Division, which will make it the right coding and the markings for the aeroplane at that time uh, of the Berlin Airlift, which was 1948-49. Now, um, what we didn't know about the aeroplane was its operational history and its past history. Uh, and we've subsequently found out through the Smithsonian Museum in, 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 the, in the States that uh, in, in, during World War II, she was commissioned in, uh, in March, uh, straight into the US Navy uh, and given a BU number which is a naval naval number and uh, it was operated by the US Marine Corps so uh, what they were doing at that time was is, is, is quite an amazing feat where they were taking the islands of Japan and going through Iwo Jima to Okinawa and into Japan and um, she was she was operating with um, Marine Corps squadrons at that time one of them VR1, VR11, VR6 uh, and then uh, those, those airlines were primarily used for um, carrying marine tr troops to the front line and taking um, vital equipment and, uh, and, and ordnance and things that they needed on the front line, ammunition. But most importantly it was uh, live blood that was coming from the people of America, uh, people that were back home donating blood, uh, which was vital to uh, the MASH stations over on the front lines uh, at that time. It was its load capability and uh, the fact that it could fly for such long distances at, uh, uh, and its endurance was second to none for any aircraft at the time. Um, it's got this double cargo door on the side here, which was to aid easy access and, and loading uh, into the fuselage and it could carry I believe up to about nine ton of, uh, of cargo and supply. Cargo would have uh, variated from uh, small Willys Jeeps that would have gone into there. It could take a small tank uh, uh, and then obviously uh, pallets and pallets full of uh, vital supplies. It would have taken troops uh, and the aeroplane would have been configured in, in these different uh, configurations to accommodate what was necessary at the time. So the primary roles being a cargo, a troop carrier, and a hospital ship. So once you get inside the fuselage, you will see that it has been geared out for as a hospital station, uh, places uh, for stretchers to be uh, mounted and loaded in there. Uh, and it could carry uh, probably a couple of platoons of, of, of injured soldiers or soldiers going out uh, to the front line. What's important today is uh, we've got uh, Sam Evans over here, engineer. He's our, our uh, engineering director on the project. And we've got Owen and uh, Joe over there. They two young apprentices from Marshall's Aerospace, uh, working over Duxford on, on classic and vintage aircraft uh, uh, of various forms. And uh, the important thing, the job for us to do this morning, is to remove the nose wheel and to to, to split the nose wheel, so we can put a new tire on on the front. Uh, and that's uh, that's what's happening today. Hopefully, we can get it done, uh, and it all works and happens uh, successfully this morning. Uh, you can see we've got uh, four big engines on this aircraft. They are Pratt & Whitney R2000s, uh, giving out about 1,400, 1,450 horsepower each. Um, they're big, big engines, and uh, they are known for their dependency. And uh, this aeroplane, uh, during its lifetime, would have had to fly very long distances uh, of about 4,000 nautical miles uh, between California and the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, her main base being uh, at Pearl Harbor, at, at, a, at, a, at a base, uh, a naval air station called Barber's Point, was basically a home base for this aeroplane. Um, and uh, so, when we have been d in discussions with uh, the curator of the naval air station Barber's Point Museum, we 
quizzed him about what C-54s would have been doing during the time of World War II and leading up into the Korean War and the Korean campaign. Um, what we understand is that Pearl Harbor was a, a central hub for, for hospitals and, and this is where patients and uh, injured soldiers and personnel from the front, front line would have been brought to Pearl Harbor, then assessed and those that were, were critical would have then gone on to uh, be transported across the Pacific to California. Uh, any of those pr uh, critically injured personnel that were of British uh, origin, uh, British Army, British military, British Air Force, they would have uh, then moved on to uh, Washington. So this airplane would then have flown from California, El, El Toro in California, up to Washington. From there, the, uh, the uh, personnel would have then been transferred by ship over the Atlantic back to, back to England. So we, from what we understand is that one of her very early roles in World War II was the repatriation of British POWs from the Japanese prisoner of war camps. Uh, these would have been ferried on C-54, maybe even this particular one, uh, or many like her, uh, back to Pearl Harbor uh, and then back onto El Toro for assessment. And um, so the British connection, although it being a Pacific and a very American aeroplane, um, is that British POWs coming out of the Japanese concentration camps and prisoner war camps would have been ferried home on C-54s like this, if not in this very particular aircraft. They would have been then ferried back to Pearl Harbor and then from California on to Washington, back home to England. Um, so that's where the British connection comes in. And uh, going through, she stayed in the Pacific. Her history is phenomenal with over 30, 30 odd years of military history. She stayed in the Pacific operating out of Guam and out of Japan and going through into the Korean campaign. It, it flew uh, sorties and uh, transportation sorties all through the Korean War, uh, bringing in vital blood again uh, to the front line and bringing in medication and anything the MASH stations needed. Uh, it would have been bringing in cargo and supplies as well as Marines uh, and tr troops. It stayed within the Pacific theater of war right through its career. Uh, soon after the Korean campaign, things really heated up and it went, uh, went into the Vietnam campaign. But just before we get into that, um, before the Korean campaign started heating up, the reason why um, we have her in Berlin airlift con configuration is because one of the squadrons she operated on was VR-6. Now VR-6 uh, Marine Corps squadron was uh, a Berlin airlift squadron. And about three quarters of the C-54s that were based out in Guam, uh, out in the, Philipp in, in the, in the Pacific, um, Three quarters of the, of the uh, C-54s based out in the Pacific with VR-6 squadron went on to fly in the Berlin airlift. Um, the, the previous owners of this airplane or any previous history owners didn't know this. Uh, this was only just recently found out. Um, so that is why the, we're going to change it from Atlantic Division to Pacific Division. Uh, and then the coding that we've got it on, the colors and the schemes, will be very representative uh, for, for Berlin airlift. And uh, that's her affiliation with that. Going back to the, uh, after the Korean War and leading into the Vietnam War, which sort of heated up and started to take effect in 1955. And as we know, the, 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 the Vietnam War was a bit of a, uh, a dead loss war where we lost many, many, many personnel. It was a war that uh, um, soldiers were very young. It's a, it's a war that hasn't been very popular uh, amongst many nations um, because there were no winners at the end of the day. Nobody won, nobody lost, uh, uh, other than the, the young men and soldiers and personnel that were lost during that, during that campaign. It ended in about 75, and that's when its military service ended. It flew into uh, Mon Monaghan uh, Air Base in Arizona, and that's where she, she stood there for a couple of years, about eight years, before she was snapped up and uh, reconfigured into a sprayer, tanker, water bomber configuration. Um, she operated like that for about nine years, uh, and in the, then 1987, uh, her life came to an end as a, a civilian aircraft. It languished in, the, in Arizona for a, f a further eight, nine years, and in 1995 or 96, uh, the Atlantic Warbird Group, led by Jim Voisel and uh, Mr. Voss, uh, purchased her uh, in Arizona. And basically, they, uh, 
They, they didn't know the history of this particular aircraft based on a serial number. They had no knowledge of that. Um, they overhauled the engines, looked at the, the aircraft over, and there were many sitting there to choose from. Thank goodness they chose this one. It has a lot of history. Uh, and they flew it over to New York. She came in uh, bright, sil bright silver, polished fuselage uh, with no markings on at all. And uh, they spent about half a million dollars over the next few years restoring her and getting her ba back into ship shape uh, when she was then sold off uh, in 2002 uh, for an HBO film. Uh, and this is how she ended up in, uh, in North Wheel, being flown across the Atlantic, a pair of them landing at North Wheel. And uh, here she is today. She's now uh, being gifted to the C-54 Skymaster Society, soon to be a trust set up uh, to restore this aeroplane, put it back to flight with uh, very valued volunteers. Well, um, we, f we have uh, formed the C-54 Skymaster soon to be trust. Uh, which is currently, gr the restoration is being uh, done by a group of uh, volunteers in the, and we formed a society of volunteers to restore the aeroplane. And as you can see here, there's uh, bits of corrosion everywhere. And this way she's been just sitting out in the beautiful British weather uh, and uh, is decomposing in, in areas and corroding. Um, this all has to be redone. All the areas are going to have to be cleaned off uh, to get back. Areas of corrosion like that where we've got a plate that needs to be replaced, um, we do with the old, the old uh, method, the old granddad's method of using English wheels where you start rolling bits of material uh, to actually shape it to that. So we'll use this part here for instance as a pattern uh, and then as a template for uh, a new piece of uh, metal that goes in there. Uh, that will be then rolled on an English wheel and riveted back into place, into situ. Now they are, you can see this is exactly what's happened with this piece over here, which would have been put on back in uh, probably in 95, 96. Uh, so that is a rolled piece of, uh, new piece of material. As is that one there, you can see is very different to that one there. So that's a, a previous repair or restoration, as is that. Um, the underside, funny enough, of the aeroplane looks worse than it is because um, you can see here where there's been leaks of some kind of fluid or residue coming out here and underneath the wing here and the, the, the wing spar caps have all been painted. So this is all painted over. This will clean off uh, and get back to, to bare metal and that's the finish that we want to get this aeroplane back to is to get rid of all the corrosion, get all the, the, uh, the, the paint and the residue off and get it back to shiny, shiny bare metal, which should look, should come up like that. Um, all the undercarriage and the gear is going to be serviced and overhauled. Um, hydraulics people and uh, are going to get involved with that. We've uh, got to service and, and overhaul the entire undercarriage and all the rams and that on the ailerons and the flaps. So we've got a flap system here, which have been put down in the drop position and we have various rams that come out of here which have to be serviced, overhauled uh, and put back. So quite a lot of work, uh, it's quite a lot of money. We are budgeting on a, on a restoration. Uh, it's not going to be a perfect, perfect restoration. In other words, it won't look shiny brand new. We want to try and keep the character of the aircraft there and to, to show that it, you know, it, it has been a hard working aeroplane all its life. It's got 21,000 hours on the airframe, uh, but they are strong and robust aeroplanes. These, these aeroplanes tend to go on for a very, very long time, as, as she has. She's already flown for over 70 years. Uh, and there's no reason that she cannot continue to fly or will, will not fly. Um, so that is our plan as a society, is uh, with it surrounded by a good group of en engineers. And then with the help of corporate sponsors that want to get on board, and support us uh, in, in many ways they can. Sponsors uh, can come on board as a, uh, a restoration partner, uh, which, is, which is vital for us, where we, we actually need a certificate for everything that is overhauled or any part that needs to be fabricated, has to come out of a shop, which is CAA, FAA approval, and it gets a Form 1 certificate to go with it. Then we put those new parts or restored parts back, back onto the aircraft. Um, so we have got, uh, we are talking to corporates about that, coming on as a restoration partner. 
uh, and more so we need money as well. It's, it's going to take funding and, and quite a lot of funding uh, to, to get this aircraft air, airworthy. Um, we are talking to the FAA and what they want us to do and how we're going to take this process forward. So we've got a meeting in New York very soon with the FAA and we're going to do a step-by-step -step, uh, guideline and, and, and uh, how we're going to take this uh, aircraft through its stages uh, and different phases of restoration. So we're going to be guided by the FAA. They need, we need them on board. We need to, uh, to convince them that we do have the skills and expertise and the financial support behind us as well. That, that, is, that is a crucial thing. The, the fact that we got young volunteers on board uh, and having the trust behind us allows us to have access to uh, corporate sponsorship, trust fund money, uh, and grants and that from other, other sources. Um, so it's watching this space. We, we've uh, given that all over to David Stewart, uh, the man behind the camera, who is, uh, is going to be our fundraising man. And his task is to meet with our uh, sponsors and hopefully win them over and get them on board and excited about this project. Good. Well, the plan, as you can see, we are sitting out here on the apron at North Weald and uh, we've got all these uh, drums lying around, which are a bit of a nuisance for us at the moment. Um, we need to get the aeroplane moved into a, a more secure site so we can work on it. The plan is actually to get rid of all these drums. We're going to have a workstation on, on, on this side with a container and on that side of the aircraft as well is going to be a parts store and a container on the, on the far side of the aircraft uh, over there. This entire area is going to be fenced off, so it'll be a sterile area where we can work in. On top of the wing sections here during the uh, uh, English winters, which can be quite long and uh, quite dreary, um, we're going to be putting up a tented uh, platform to cover the entire span of the, uh, the, outer, the, the, the inner section of the wings, and that allows us to get to the engine, engine areas. And uh, with the wing section over here, we got, we got an, uh, an AD, an airworthiness directive that needs to, to be done, and that is to take the outer section of the wing off, um, which actually narrows the span of the wing quite, quite considerably. That will allow us to get this into a hangar, uh, into a dry environment, if we need to work on the aircraft too. And uh, as we've got the outer wing section off, we will be uh, refabricating the ailerons that are on there. Uh, and that we can probably do in-house with the, with, the, with the fabric work, uh, as goes with the rudder and the elevators, all fabric, and that needs to be refabric uh, as well, new fabric on that. But what we've done, we're going to have that structure over in the winter months, uh, over the wing side here, that will allow the team of engineers to work on the aircraft throughout the winter, uh, and the primary thing there is the repairs that need to be done onto the caps of the spars. Uh, for the for the bits of corrosion we got on there.